next speaker is State Representative Martin uh, Powerlack. He was first elected to serve the 41st District in Michigan's House of Representatives in November of 2012, representing the residents of Troy and, Cla and Claussen. He is currently serving his second term in office. Representative Howerlich is the Vice Chair of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules and the Vice Chair of the Committee on Oversight and Ethics. He is also a member of the Committees on Criminal Justice, the Judiciary, and Tax Policy. Representative Howerlich received his Bachelor of Science degree with an emphasis in Geological Sciences from the University of Michigan in 1998 and a Master of Accounting degree from the University of Michigan in 2003. He is a licensed and practicing CPA in Troy, Michigan. He has extensive experience auditing local governments and small businesses, preparing and analyzing financial statements and advising small businesses. He has also been a local a business owner and entrepreneur since 1990. He also has been active in his Troy community, serving most recently as a Troy City Councilman and Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem. And I want to thank, thank him as well for being with us today. He will be speaking about the state of our state. I'm gradually getting to appreciate what it's, it's like to age. And so what I mean by that is I'm like, well, okay, where's the, where's the chalkboard? When I was in the university, I had professors that would feverishly write on the chalkboard as chunks of chalk were flying through the air. And um, it's, it's amazing how things have progressed. And I went to a school, by the way, that Troy High School, a, an advanced high school, but when I graduated, we had four computers, and I think they were in the process of building a computer lab. And so here I am before you with a PowerPoint that I can easily produce on my computer in the comforts of my couch in the living room or the family room. and. So we have definitely advanced, and I don't have to pretend like I know how to write coherently on the chalkboard. So here's some contact information, reppowerlack.com, that is an official state website. Um, if you can't remember how to spell my name, because that Y always throws people off, you can go to uh, house.mi.gov, the official government website for the state House of Representatives. Uh, they gave you a little bio about me. Um, it's interesting being a CPA in the legislature, uh, whereas uh, attorneys typically will run for office to um, get out in the public limelight. CPAs are more apt to find the nearest rock and to kind of hide under it or the shadow to, to stand in. And that's why you see out of 110 members of the House, there are only four of us. And of the four of us, I think I may be the only one who's actually in private practice, because one of them is not practicing as a public accountant, and the other one is, is doing other things, and I think the fourth is probably retired from the profession. So, if time permits, and by the way, I um, have, have coined the phrase uh, chronologically challenged for people like me, who have no concept of time whatsoever, sometimes we're early, sometimes we're late, three minutes for us and maybe an hour for the rest of the world. So if we can get through this, and by the way, I've structured this so we can actually cut this off at any particular slide without feeling like you've been shortchanged. Somebody can kind of give me the little note that either that or when you guys start yawning, I will realize I need to clear the air and clear the deck for everybody's favorite, Harry Verizon. So we will try to cover three things. By the way, I have a mixture of slides from the governor's office my own slides, and also the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. The slides that I've incorporated from other entities, I do not necessarily agree with their policy directives. However, they have produced nice slides that will <laughs> illustrate what uh, we need to do. All right, so what's, what's really indicative of, and, and by the way, the relevance of, of the other speakers to those of us who are policymakers is quite profound because you know we are trying to do things to create a better economic situation for the people of the state of Michigan. And before I get to this slide, just to give you a brief overview, we have 110 members of the Michigan House, 38 members of the Michigan Senate, and of course the governor. And the 
House and the Senate are organized by committees, and so the heavy lifting, if you will, happens in committee. And in any given legislative setting, you have about 4,000 bills that get introduced. It's completely impossible for anybody to actually do their legislative work, their constituent work, work with their staff, do their policy work, put forward amendments, and, and actually read and understand all 4,000 bills. Thankfully, we don't. Only about 800 or so actually get signed into law by the governor. But as we'll discuss later, when, we're do, when, when I go over some of the, uh, the legislation attached to the, to the May ballot proposal, you'll understand um, how fast-paced the, um, the situation is. And so we don't walk into the legislature on a legislative sitting and obtain all the information we need to know by osmosis. A lot happens um, outside the realm of, of actually the, the House meeting for general session. The, the general sessions in the House and the Senate, quite frankly, are a small snippet of, of what actually goes on. And perhaps on another day, I can, when I have uh, another 30 minutes or so, we can go over uh, the operations and the effects of, of uh, uh, the organization of the legislature on public policy, because it is a much, much bigger entity than, than even I realized until I arrived on the scene with uh, literally over, um, over 2,000 people working in support of the legislature. All right, so we start off with some slides that um, um, correlate really, really well to the, uh, the governor's state of the state presentation. And these were actually put out by the, the governor's office and, and state departments. But we see, um, and, and we of course all have, have known and experienced the, the Great Recession. We had a, <coughs> Michigan is well known for having a greater amplitude in, in economic uh, changes than the rest of the country. And so when, when the, the country sneezes, we get pneumonia, basically. And we, um, and of course, these are all um, government numbers, and as we know, they don't necessarily indicate people who have dropped out of the workforce or people that are working in, in uh, professions or jobs that, quite frankly, are below their, their educational level. You know, the, old, the proverbial doctor working in the cab thing. So what we have seen, though, is since August of 2009, we've seen a dramatic decrease in unemployment in the state of Michigan. We've seen a tremendous number of private sector jobs created. We have um, 300,000 private sector jobs created, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute. We've had a number of people uh, join Healthy Michigan. That's not necessarily an indicator of a strong economy, per se. Healthy Michigan, by the way, is the uh, colloquial term that is used to refer to Medicaid expansion in Michigan. Uh, <laughs> 86,000 manufacturing jobs created and in a, in quite a bit of economic investment in the state. As we've alluded to before, um, motor vehicle production has increased quite substantially as well. Um, there's that slide talking about the 86,000 manufacturing jobs. That's relevant because those are typically associated with uh, higher socioeconomic status than, than the retail jobs. Uh, people don't go to college to become Walmart breeders. They go to college to be engineers, economists, accountants, and, and so on. Uh, this is a rather chaotic slide, and I will admit it, it was put out by the, the House Republican Caucus. The numbers, as an accountant, this particular slide drives me a little bit crazy because you have different comparisons, the years on the left and the right, and each of the subsets of this slide are uh, not necessarily comparable, but the take home on this is that we're seeing an expansion of the GDP, the GDP nationally, the state of Michigan's relevance to economic <coughs> expansion is more pronounced. My particular favorite uh, portion of this slide is in the lower right-hand corner, and that's that the business tax climate has improved substantially from 49th to 14th. And it, one is hard to argue <coughs> that when you reduce regulation and re reduce um, uh, tax uncertainties and make a, a lower tax burden on uh, capital investment, in other words, that you can have a greater return on investment because the government is not going to take its hand out of, out of your, uh, take as much of your return on investment. Those are all things that stimulate um, capital investment. There was a tremendous tax uncertainty in the state of Michigan when we went from the single business tax to the to Michigan business tax. And now that we have a very simplified corporate income tax structure, if you have a corporation, a C corporation, or an S corporation, you simply pay 6% of your net profits. Those of you who may have LLCs or S corporations, 
you only pay on that which flows to the bottom line to your personal MI1040. It's a much simplified structure, so um, even my friends who are socialists would have to admit that the business tax climate is much better than it was, but my socialist friends would say that it is irrelevant. <laughs> Smart tax reform, uh, we have alluded to and discussed briefly the Michigan business tax, and the, but also the personal property tax is being phased out. Um, that is, from a CPA standpoint, I like uh, policy simplicity. Um, even though it is a good thing to phase out the industrial personal property tax and to not tax personal property tax payers who have property tax of under $50,000, this is the, the, the other side of this is exceptionally complicated when it comes to local units of government re being reimbursed by the state for their loss of tax revenue. Because if, if you take, you, you cannot effectively pull out the rug from, from the local units of government who, who are providing primary level services of police, fire, and courts without making sure that they can provide those services without otherwise simply pushing the tax burden down the line to the to the, uh, the homeowner and other real property taxes. And so the lieutenant governor, in order to explain this to the local elected officials in, in 2009, before all of the pieces came into play, and, and this was um, enacted by our vote, by the way, last year, before, he, he actually took about two hours explaining that. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna bore you to death by going through that. Suffice it to say, personal property taxes are being phased out over the next six years, approximately for industrial uh, personal property taxpayers and those who have small businesses with less than $50,000 of personal property tax uh, no longer have that burden. It's a very good thing, by the way, for the tax assessors and local units of government who don't have to keep track of the small business who may own one computer and four chairs. It, it's no longer required. And so my local assessor is very happy to have a, re a reduction in, in regulatory burden of compliance. Record keeping. Three pop this is actually a profound slide here. Uh, three consecutive years of population growth. And that may not sound like much, but when you look at population reductions and also demographic shifts, uh, if you go to the census website and, and, and want to look at some more granular information, most local uh, municipalities, Troy is where I come from, and there's a significant break in between the 2000 census and the 2010 census for people 55 and younger. And, it, and for people like me who are now 40, it, it's actually really exciting because for the last 20 years of my life, people have been saying that I'm young. And mm -hmm. most other, uh, uh, my wife is Australian, and I go to Australia and they say I'm old because it's a much younger place. But the demographic shift um, is definitely happening in Michigan. It certainly is happening in Troy. Uh, between those two census um, undertakings in 2000 and 2010, the population under 55 dropped, the population over 55 increased. And so we had um, uh, additionally a decade of, of population out, outflow. So this is a big thing for us, a really big thing for us to have three consecutive years of population growth. And my economist friends to the right will say that it's, it's important to have a healthy distribution of age groups in order to make sure that you have a healthy economy. Uh, this is um, also something that's important for the well-being in the state of Michigan, it's, it's reduction in crime. Um, as many may or may not know, uh, Flint was the most dangerous city in America, and Detroit was the second most dangerous city in, in America. And as a matter of fact, um, in, up until recently, if you put the, the murderers in Detroit and Flint together, you would have more murders in the entire um, Confederation of Canada, which of course is much bigger than Detroit and Flint combined. So uh, we are going in the right direction. And I would say that uh, we have had a, an increase in police protection at Pontiac because of the county sheriff taking that over. Uh, the city of Pontiac, of course, was actually all of these cities other than Saginaw have been in, in receivership or have had an emergency manager. And that has actually precipitated a dramatic change in the way policing has happened in these communities. And as a result, you've seen crime reduction. All right, so I put this slide on here because I don't think that people have a full impact 
or full, full appreciation of the number of people that are receiving government funded health care uh, with or without Obamacare. And um, just as an aside, we um, expanded Medicaid in the state of Michigan last year, actually it was two years ago, and um, is when the legislation passed, it was last year when it went into effect. And it added over 505,000 people to a new um, eligibility of Medicaid. Additionally, we had the, uh, the people that came into the system either because of Medicaid expansion or because of Obamacare who found out that they were eligible for Medicaid and hadn't actually applied for Medicaid. Because of the way Obamacare works, if you're lower income, and even if you don't want Medicaid, unless you want to pay that tax, you need to get Medicaid. And I would say even to my most fiercely um, Austrian economist friends that if you know anybody that is in a lower income bracket, and even if they don't want to use services on Medicaid, it's a lot better than paying a tax. That's me speaking as a CPA, by the way. So when you add this to the 1.9 million people that were on Medicaid, as well as the people that came out of the woodwork and um, were added to Medicaid because they didn't know they were eligible, we now have 2.5 million people in the state of Michigan on Medicaid. That's about 25% of the population. Last night I also woke up to find out what the Medicare population is. It's about 16% and growing, of course, as the relative proportion of people 65 and over in Michigan increases. So right now you have um, over 40% of Michigan on some form of, of uh, government provided health care. And again, this is before Obamacare. Um, and I think Obamacare, you have about 10% of the population getting supposedly subsidized um, insurance, but that of course is subject to uh, court ruling that will be forthcoming in the near future. Thankfully, some people are still on the old school um, uh, health insurance for the, where your employer provides it. But anyway, um, it's interesting to note because in Michigan we have the pervert, you know, everybody looks at our $52 billion budget and they say that, you know, it's a big budget, but in fact a lot of that is federal transfers. And um, so about $18 billion of, of that comes through Medicaid. So $18 billion of our budget is Medicaid and which is even greater than public education. Speaking of public education, there's, and, and I find this interesting because you have um, different groups of people that will use different numbers to support their argument. And it, it's not just in Michigan. You know, you hear the arguments about so-and-so uh, cut um, education and so on and so forth. And as somebody who loves to play with numbers and as a CPA, I find it maddening because the numbers, if you look at comparable numbers, will tell, tell the story. The, the numbers that are constantly rising on this chart are state expenditures. The red line shows federal expenditures that were given, I say given, um, taken from somebody and given to Michigan um, in order to spend on education. As we know, and Margaret Thatcher has aptly pointed out, that, that um, government expenditures all come from somewhere. And, as an aside, I will tell you that I'm even stingier with other people's money than I am with my own, and I don't spend much of my own money, as my wife will attest. I'm, I get very nervous when I actually have to buy a meal that hasn't been prepared in the house. So you can actually amplify that when I come to spending your money as a policymaker. Anyway, the red line that, that popped up between 10 and 11, that's the stimulus spending. Um, that was, and so that when it dropped off, that's when you have the cliff of the end of stimulus spending. So it turns out that when Governor Snyder came into office, he came in with his first budget, there was no federal stimulus money that came to Michigan to spend on education. And so the red plus the, the, the state expenditures, there was truly a drop in education spending in Michigan, but it was entirely attributable to a reduction in federal remittances coming to the state for education. The state expenditures, as I recall, virgin collections of money within the state boundaries um, increased. This is an interesting chart as well in light of the fact that we, we are being asked in, in uh, two months to opine as to whether or not we want to increase our taxes. The legislature took some money from the general fund and just to, to add a little bit of information to this, we have a specific restricted fund that's for transportation. So unless 
the legislature pro proactively spends money from the general fund, there's um, no money goes from the general fund to spend on roads. So this is normally zero. It's structured to be zero that comes from the general fund to spend on roads. Um, so the legislature spent extra money, is what this is showing you, on, on road um, maintenance and repairs and construction up until today. And this doesn't even include the $110 million that, that the state um, sent to the local units of government after last winter, because last winter was very harsh, and $110 million was put in addition to local units of government to cover their additional costs for winter road maintenance, which is primarily um, overtime and DPWs for uh, road snow plowing as well as salt, which um, has a little uh, spike in, in cost last year because the demand far exceeded the supply of road salt. Now we will transition into the May ballot proposal, and my intent here is to confuse the heck out of you. <laughs> because I don't like the, 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 I don't like it when we say that the public policy is like sausage. I don't like these overused metaphors, you know, creating public policy is like, is like making sausage. Um, however, this actually makes that metaphor look optimistic. I would say that creating public policy is, is like watching people get bludgeoned. Um, I was there on, uh, obviously I was there, I, I'm in my second term, I was there in the lame duck, and uh, the lame duck was quite frankly um, uh, a bunch of, um, it was deflated if you ask me, because I had all of these, lame duck is that period after the November election up until the, until the new year, and so I had all of these visions of great public policy that had been in the works for the last two years, finally coming to gel and, and getting handed to the governor for a signature. In fact, what happened was almost all of the major public policy initiatives were sidelined and sacrificed in order to make sure that we had all had a, a bipartisan kumbaya moment so that the uh, two parties could put, for, put forward some really bad public policy that we as the voters would get to vote on in May. Um, <coughs> my friends on, on the Democrat and Democrat Party, I am, by the way, a Republican, but I actually believe that the party labels are an obstacle to good public policy, and that's a discussion for another day about my dream <coughs> to have a nonpartisan legislature, which really is probably nothing more than a dream, but I think it's a good dream to have nonetheless. At any rate, my friends in the Democrat Party ended up, quite, um, even though they're in a minority, they drove the policy discussion when it came to the Rhodes proposal. They may or may not admit that, but at the end of the day, when it came down to negotiations, and what, what, what transpired was that nothing that was going to offend the Democrat Party was put forward through the lame duck, and a lot of their policy objectives were achieved through the, the grand compromise that happened. And the final piece of that is the May 5th ballot proposal. So we didn't pass the buck. Um, anytime you want to raise the, the sales tax because it is constitutionally constrained, it requires a uh, vote of the people. What they did do to pass the buck was they tie barred everything um, other than Main Street fairness, and I'll get to that in a minute. They, they tie barred everything to the May 5th ballot proposal. So if there's something in here that you see, and by the way, I see raising the sales tax as something that's a poison pill for me, but if you see something in here other than the sales tax that you don't like, that may be very well reason for you to vote no. I'm not encouraging you to vote no or yes. I'm the kind of person that when I lose the argument, I go on to the next thing, and I don't dwell on it. As a matter of fact, we all can't have our way, and I think if more people acted that way, we wouldn't have so many log jams in, in public policy. The crooks of the matter is, if you want to win your argument, you need to have a good argument. Um, so the ballot proposal question, as you may have seen in the press, was finalized, the actual wording for the, for the ballot proposal, what you will see on the ballot was finalized this week by the Board of Canvassers, um, it references increasing the sales tax from 6 to 7 percent and briefly tells you where that money is going to go and, and also mentions, I think, the, uh, by reference, tie barring the legislation. And the reason why these slides look so granular is because I put them together, but also because there's a lot that's tie barred into the, the sales tax proposal. Um, 
Oh yes, actually this is still the, the ballot language. <laughs> so it, here's, here's the question, and it says the proposed constitutional amendment will do all of these things. Eliminate the sales and use tax on gasoline, diesel fuel for vehicles on public roads, increase the portion of tax dedicated to get into the school aid fund, expand use of the school aid fund to community colleges and career technical education, give effect to laws including those that increase the sales and use tax, increase the diesel and gasoline tax, and adjust annually for inflation, expand competitive bidding and warranties for road projects, and <coughs> increase the earned income tax credit number, briefly, and should this ballot proposal be adopted. We'll briefly go through um, the, the uh, bills that the governor has signed but won't get, go into effect until or unless voters approve amendments to the state constitution. House Bill 4539, and just for those of you who may want to look these up, make sure you don't punch in the 2015-2016 legislative sitting. These are from the 2013-2014 legislative sitting. You can go to michiganlegislature.org to find all sorts of information there about the bills, including nonpartisan legislative analyses. But this bill would amend the general sales and use, excuse me, the general sales tax act to exempt gasoline and diesel fuel um, from sales taxes after October 1st of this year and provide for a one percentage point increase on the 4% portion of the total rate. Um, and what that means is, be, and, and back in two, 1995, we had a then was called Proposal A, which increased the sales tax. And those of you who are young won't realize this, but it was really neat use of a 4% sales tax in the state of Michigan. But in order to hope, reduce property rates and create more funding for schools and public education uh, from sales taxes, they increased the sales tax from 4 to 6%, and the additional 2% went to schools. So that's why the 4% is referenced here. House Bill 5492 would amend the use tax um, in a similar way. The numbers are a little bit different. Um, as we know, um, we have a sales and we also have a use tax in the state of Michigan. If anybody wants to go over these numbers later on, um, pull me aside or contact me. House Bill 5477 would amend the Motor Fuel Tax Act. Um, this is what um, is currently we're paying 19 cents a gallon on <coughs> gasoline tax and 15 cents a gallon on diesel fuel. This also sets the, um, the rate that will be um, the composite rate, because right now, when you go to the pump, and I'll show you this in a minute, this is a big bill, by the way. Um, it sets floors and ceilings and metrics and the adjustments going forward. At the end of the day, what, the, what this says is, instead of paying at the pump the 19 or the 15 if you have diesel, as well as the 6% um, the sales tax, you're gonna pay a base rate, which is going to be set in a very, in a very complicated, although for those of us that love math, not too complicated, um, calculation which sets the um, rate of fuel tax. Take home, you will never pay less than 41.7 cents per gallon for gasoline or diesel uh, taxes in the state of Michigan. Most likely you will pay more. All right, so the status quo, we pay 19 cents a gallon for diesel and a 6% sales tax. As an example, let's say that the wholesale tax rate is $2 a gallon, you'll pay the 19 cents for fuel and 13 cents sales tax. And so you will tell me that 6% of $2 is not 12 cents, and the reason because that 6% is assessed on, on top of the fuel tax. So you're paying a tax on the tax as well. That's where the extra penny comes from. You're paying today, and this is approximately where we are. It's actually a little bit higher than where we are right now on wholesale tax, which is closer to the 180, 190 level today. But you're paying approximately 32, maybe 31 cents a gallon today. You will pay 41.7 cents at the minimum going forward if this ballot proposal passes. Now keep this in mind, that's in addition, I better not step away, that's in addition to the going from 6% to 7% on your sales and use tax. I have a chart showing you at the end of the day how that all equates to $2 billion. House Bill 5493 is um, a, a very boring bill because it just um, changes the numbers in another act to be consistent with the previous act. House Bill 4630, um, those of you who own automobiles, um, you know that if you buy a new vehicle, um, and like I said, I'm frugal, I almost never buy a new vehicle, but if you do buy a new vehicle, um, 
you you know that after the first year your your plate fees go down this will not happen as a result of h b forty six thirty and this will be very um, interesting for those of you those of us who buy used vehicles because we will be paying the same license plate fees and tag fees for the vehicle based on it, its its uh, replacement value so um, if you buy a vehicle for five hundred dollars your percentage of the tab that you will pay for your plate will be quite large um, if you buy a the same vehicle for thirty thousand dollars the percentage that you will pay will be quite low because you're paying a flat rate house bill 4251 would amend public Public Act 283 of 1909, which deals with high, public highways and private roads. At the end of the day, what this says is that if townships, and this is, this is mostly for our friends, our friends outstate, um, have the right to require the road commissions to do competitive bidding. Now this seems, it's not, a, it's not as simple as it sounds because right now what's happening is the road commissions might be doing their own work and the township who's contributing so the road project may think that the road commission is not the cheapest provider of those services and this actually gives the the township the ability to say wait a minute the road commission can bid on this but if they're not the cheapest provider and we're putting forward the money then we don't want the road the road commission to provide that work it's a big deal out state house bill 5167 um, amends public act 51 of 1951 in a very tangential way because actually changing the way the money flows is the third rail of, of road construction and transportation funding policy it's, it's it's something that many of us don't like but it's so difficult to change it's probably going to take heaven and earth to move to to amend public act 51. anyway this bill um, initially was introduced and it was initially a good bill dealing with uh, uh, providing um, uh, performance-based um, guarantees and adding some transparency and guarantees to, to contracting. Some things were added to the bill that made it less uh, beautiful initially. House Bill 5460 would amend the act to establish new provisions regarding disadvantage. Yeah, this is actually, this is the bill that got really weird at the end because they literally had hundreds of pages of amendments and substitutions that were happening at the 11th hour and um, if, you, if you're the kind of person that likes to actually know what you're voting on it's not a good time to be voting on bills they added some preferences and not just like a paragraph or two but pages of pre um, dealing with uh, prefer uh, preferences for disadvantaged business enterprises when it comes to road construction to try to funnel more money to uh, uh, for groups who are perceived to be disadvantaged um, and the reason why I had issues with this is because it really wasn't, um, it was a policy change that really didn't have any, any transparent analysis as, as to whether or not it was good policy. It never went through committee, it happened. That's why this bill, in my mind, was not good. So, Senate Bill 847, this is a big deal here, would amend the Income Tax Act to increase the earned income tax credit from 6% to 20% of the credit allowed under Section 32 of the Federal Internal Revenue Code beginning with the 2016 tax year. Senate Bill 847 would also increase the amount of the Homestead Property Tax Credit for senior citizens and disabled taxpayers whose household total, total household resources are between $3,001 and $6,000 by reducing the household income qualifiers. But the, the big piece of this is the earned income tax credit. And one of the things that I brought up was, well, the Internal Revenue Service in their estimates say that 25% of, of EITC filings are fraudulent uh, um, or, or otherwise corrupted. In other words, be, um, in order to remain um, a qualifier for the EITC, people may actually earn more money, uh, but they're in cash businesses or cash industries, and so they're paid under the table, um, and the enforcement is lax. Um, there are literally billions of dollars that are paid out federally in EITC to people who don't deserve it or don't qualify for it. And additionally, the people that qualify for it probably don't, um, and don't actually claim it. And so what that means is we're piggybacking on that fraud. And by my estimates, we will be paying out $100 million of additional money through state EITC 
um, to people who are fraudulently claiming it. And so I brought up the issue of increasing tax audits from Treasury, and people looked at me like a deer in the headlights. And so I don't like paying out money to people fraudulently, and that's um, whether or not there's merit to expanding the EITC. Um, uh, even if you believe so, you would hopefully agree that we shouldn't pay out money fraudulently. Finally, it's important to note that, and you may read in the press that we're restoring the EITC. The truth of the matter is the EITC historically at the state level was never at 20%. In 2005, I believe, was the year they raised it to 20%. When Governor Snyder came in, he um, looked at the budget deficit and said this is something that uh, we couldn't afford, and so we reduced it back to six, which is where it historically was. So now we're going to, so it's like a yo-yo, six, 20, six, 20. Senate Bill 80 um, is um, amends the State School Aid Act to require districts to make information regarding disbursements and expenses available to the public on their websites, which is good. You, you know, you might scratch your head and say, why is this require a bill to do so? It seems like good public policy. And I would agree with you. But the part of this which is really weird is it also um, appropriates an additional $40 million um, to at-risk programming in the school aid budget, which you know we may or may not think about that as a good thing. But the question I would throw out there is why should this be added as an amendment to a, a bill, a transparency bill, without going through the appropriations process annually. Um, so that actually is, um, in a nutshell, and that's about as nutshell as I can make this, what's happening in there. I've got five minutes. I remember my chronological challenges that I face, I appreciate that. So um, anyway, it, uh, there's a lot to think about when you go to the ballot in May, but I would encourage you all to go to the ballot in May. Real quickly, I want to talk about something that's in the press and it, it dramatically impacts our uh, fiscal budget here, our fiscal situation here in Michigan is the Michigan Economic Growth Authority. And the take home on this is that between 2008 and 2011, they dramatically increased um, tax credits in the state of Michigan. And you can see that pretty um, dramatically on this chart. Um, historically, up until that point, and I know Governor Angler was a big proponent of these things, I actually was first elected to office as somebody who was opposed to governments picking and choosing winners and losers. So I come from from that uh, uh, standpoint. However, I'm always willing to see somebody else's argument and see how I might be wrong, but this is a really good example of bad public policy without an, a full appreciation and understanding of how that public policy impacts the budget. Um, you put all of this together, and I will skip over this so we can actually get to the, the meat of this, is that the, the mega liability um, accrued liability um, actually uh, on an annualized basis increased from $25 million a year in 2010 to half a billion dollars or more or a year starting right now, uh, which is why we ha had to adjust for a sudden um, uh, deficit that the state had that you may have read about in the press. Um, I seem to have forgotten to put in here the a chart that shows that we have $9.4 billion of accrued liability today for mega credits. And they're very unpredictable. They are um, tethered to the Michigan business tax, which doesn't exist anymore. However, companies that receive mega tax credits are allowed to elect to continue to file the, the Michigan business tax, which is a constant source of litigation in this state. And so we will not actually get rid of the Michigan business tax for another 30 years because they are tethered to the um, mega tax credits. But um, this shows how, they, um, how there's unpredictable liability. Uh, but at the, um, and since my time is up here, I did want to simply say, um, show, um, mention mega because it has a dramatic um, impact on policy going forward. And we have had hearings in the tax policy committee dealing with mega tax credits, as well as film tax credits and other incentive programs. Uh, during that 2008 until 2011, uh, the, the policymakers in Michigan, and I think many states, have started throwing Hail Marys and swinging for the fences. And um, we, have, we, we, we have cost blowout here. We actually have a major policy catastrophe. and. Um, 
in, unless something is done, the rest of us who are paying our taxes and, and doing the right thing, the businesses that have been here, haven't asked or threatened to leave the state of Michigan, never got a tax credit, will be bearing the burden. And that's my presentation. So uh, <laughs> it's a real sour note, Dan, and I apologize, but um, it, for an accountant, I, I have great frustration to policymakers that don't think of the impact of the results. And we have, because of term limits, whether you like them or not, uh, people can, can, can create bad policy and then they go off into the wilderness and somebody's left holding the bag and gets blamed for it. But the people that actually created the problem can point to the people because usually there's a lag time, if you will, in, in bad public policy. So these are things that we'll be discussing going forward and hopefully making the right decisions so that the people that come after us can have an easier time making public policy decisions. Thank you very much.